Okay, well, we are going to officially kick things off now. I want to welcome all of our attendees for joining us today. My name is Tom Giovanetti. I'm the president of the Institute for Policy Innovation. We are a 35-year-old conservative free market think tank based in Dallas. So I'd like to welcome you all to our Zoom policy briefing today on a momentous Supreme Court term with our longtime friend, the distinguished professor of law, Richard Epstein. We appreciate you all being here with us today. I want to especially thank those of you who are financial supporters of our work, including those of you who chose to make donations when you registered for this event. We very much appreciate it. And if after this discussion, you decide you'd like to become a supporter, please contact Addie Crimmins at IPI. And you have her email address on all of the event communications that you've received. And she will be delighted to tell you about our giving society or to help you determine how you would like to get involved with us here at IPI. So as I said, we're very delighted today to have longtime friend of IPI, Professor Richard Epstein with us to talk us through this very significant Supreme Court term. And I'm also delighted to turn things over to Dr. Merrill Matthews, IPI's resident scholar, to introduce Professor Epstein and to kick things off. Well, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Richard. It is my pleasure to introduce Richard. He is a longtime friend and uh, going back uh, over 30 years. The, uh, he is the uh, Peter and Kirsten Bedford Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He is the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of Law at New York University Law School and a senior lecturer at University of Chicago, where he was for so many years. Uh, Richard has written so many books. He, he is a machine, used to be hard to keep up with him. I don't think he's written as many here lately, but he was hard to keep up with on all his books. In fact, he did one for IPI at one point, Overdose, How Excessive Government Regulation Stifles Pharmaceutical in Innovation. This came out in 2006. In six. A, 2006, IPI book published by Yale University Press. And... Uh, He's, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, I can say we, Richard and I have traveled a few places on airplanes together, and it was always interesting to me, Richard, I don't know if you remember this, but you have taught so many years in law schools and people, so many people have heard your lectures that it was, it, it wasn't, I wouldn't come frequent, but okay, uh, people on the airplanes came up to you and said, Richard, I was your student, or I heard your lecture at such and such. That happened on the airplane several times. So you got a sense about his reach and impact out there on, uh, on the public and upon the, uh, the legal profession. So Richard's going to take about 20 minutes or so to talk about his thoughts on some of the, the three or four major cases. If he wants to mention some of the minor cases, that's good as well. After he finishes that, we will... Uh, Again, going to uh, Tom and I may have a few questions for him, and then we'll go to your questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Richard. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, in terms of my teaching career, you know, I, my last book was 2020, and my last case book was the same year, but I may try to write something. You know, I tentative thought that to write a book about what I regard as the single largest nonstop fiasco in American life, which is the professional management of the COVID situation that we've had. And since that was an issue that arose in this last term, it's probably worth in no particular order to say a few things about this. And, and what I want to say is somewhat um, unconventional about these cases. Um, there are two ways in which you could start to think about cases, whether you're at the Supreme Court or at the trial level. And one of them is to treat them as legal questions where occult and subtle issues of administrative law are the sorts of things on which you make or break a particular case. And what this does is it requires you to look quite closely at the particular statute that authorizes a given kind of program. And then what you have to do is to see whether or not uh, the particular situation that you have falls within the scope of that particular situation. And the reason is notwithstanding the fact that we're uneasy about the non-delegation doctrine, it's very clear that administrative agencies do have to have delegated authority. And at certain times, they could simply stray very far beyond what that scope is. There is another way of looking at these kinds of cases, which is the one that I've always preferred, which is you start at the other end of the barrel and you begin with the science and try to learn it. And one of my friends, Howard Crane, many, many years ago, then a prominent partner at Kirk Ornelas, he said, Richard, he says, if you want to be a decent trial lawyer in these things, you must master the science before you can worry about the law. 
And the explanation, I think, runs as follows. Uh, huge amounts of this case are going to depend upon the particular sciences, whether you're talking about opioids or talking about lead or COVID or anything else. And the administrative law part gets undue attention with respect to the public because that's transferable from one particular case to the other. So if you have a good instinct about the way in which you want to think about administrative law in connection with the COVID overreach under OSHA, is going to give you some sense about the way in which you would want to think about administrative law in connection with the administrative overreach in cases like West Virginia against the EPA, uh, dealing with the question of what counts as a system for the best reduction of administer of, of a best system of admission reductions and so forth. Well, when I looked at the particular COVID cases, this is all what I found. Um, nobody, but nobody argued anything about the science. Um, everything was done exactly on this administrative level. And, and so what happens is when the case comes out, it seemed to me it was pretty clear uh, that you cannot rerun the entire American economy by OSHA, which is designed to figure out how equipment ought to be kept safe in a particular workplace, which is remarkably similar if you think about it to the case in West Virginia against the EPA, where it is how you make this kind of equipment safe enough so that it gives you effective systems for administrative reduction. And so in one case, what you do is you want to control the world. And in the other case, you also want to control the world. And generally speaking, administrators are not very good at world domination because they don't know anything about it. Now, when it comes to ignorance with respect to COVID, it's very hard to know who you want to put at the top of this rather long and undistinguished list. Uh, but certainly President Biden is, is one of the people who counts as one of the least educated, least informed, least knowing of this particular situation. And there are many people in the CDC and the FDA and other government agencies who do this. And so what they do is they duck this particular stuff, uh, but you have to take it into account. And so when you start looking at the vaccines, um, one of the things you have to do is to take a leaf from Merrill Matthews' book. Uh, why Merrill would want to ask, it's because what happens is everything takes place at the margin. And what I mean by that is if you come up with a novel technology that is somewhat untested, you cannot assume that if it works, a debated proposition in the first iteration, it's going to work in the second iteration. All of these systems turn out to be dynamic. And so that what happens is uh, as the vaccine starts to work in one particular way, the virus starts to adapt to it. And all of a sudden, uh, things that were effective in the first iteration are either dangerous on the one hand or ineffective on the other hand, meaning that you can't satisfy either of the FDA's general twin imperatives that things be safe and effective before they're put into use. And so to me, it's an extremely easy case to say that the government absolutely had to fail because when this case got to the Supreme Court, they were relying on statistics which they had from four or five months before the case was argued. And in addition to that, those statistics were based on events that took place four or five months before that. Or to put it to you another way, all the statistics were Delta. And by this time, we were in the middle of Omicron, a virus with very different situations. So the first lesson that I want to say about the way in which you think about these cases is you have to be reasonably confident that you get the science right. And what is so tragic about this is that in the legal setting, none of these particular issues start to come forward and you're likely to make very serious mistakes. And here I'm not relying on my own vision of what the science is, uh, but what I think is it's important to recognize that the CDC puts forward a blameless situation. The Obama administration tries to build on that, but there are large numbers of positions out there and vaccine, and vaccine experts and so forth who signal the other way. The same thing is true with respect to masks. Uh, I have said from the beginning, uh, if you're thinking of going to a place and saying it's too dangerous to go without a mask, I'll wear a mask, you shouldn't go there unless there's some serious necessity. These things simply cannot do what is claimed of them. Uh, to put it in a very simple way, masks are useless against aerosols, against mist. They're only good against droplets. I've been in airports and various other places for the last two and a half years like everybody else and nobody's ever coughed on me. Uh, and so what you're doing is you're protecting against something which is relatively non-trivial, creating all sorts of difficulties, the inhalation of fires and all the rest of it. So when I think of this case, I think the Supreme Court came out the right way. But I do think the case is much more important for the following proposition. It turns out we have to completely rethink the way in which we do public law to recognize that the merits of these cases start to matter on the way in which these things ought to come out. 
Now, the second case that I mentioned, of course, was the one having to do with West Virginia and the EPA, and the question of what do we mean by the best systems of emissions reduction? Now, in order to deal with this particular question, uh, you really have to have some sense, again, of what the basic science is on the way in which various sorts of things are going to happen. Right now, there are rumors, I hope they're false, that President Biden is going to call a sort of a national or global emergency with respect to global warming. And the sole source of emergency is he cannot get his agenda through Congress because there are at least one or two Democrats in the Senate who will not go along with him. The fact that the Democratic Party is absolutely unified behind the president with not a single voice of dissent is a distressing feature. Um, and it's also distressing that you get the same kind of unity on the Republican side. But when you start looking at this, uh, the question is what counts as a system? And, and this is a major problem with respect to linguistic philosophy that takes place with every kind of work. And so the first question you have to ask yourself is half a heap a heap. Well, we're not quite sure. Is half a project a project? Is half a market a market? And it turns out, well, the big thing may be a market, the little thing may be a sub-market of one thing or another. And so when you actually are getting to this particular case, there are two rival definitions of system uh, that will put forward. Uh, one that was taken by the dissent and by the courts down below, in which before the word system, you put the word eco. And what that means, in effect, is that the best systems of emissions reductions will require the displacement of sort of fossil fuel type technologies, putting into their place other kinds of technologies that depend on wind and solar. The implicit assumption, always false, is that any alternative te technique which we have in useful time is risk-free, while the one we have is always risky. Uh, this is another version of the old Nirvana fallacy made famous by the late um, Harold Demsitz, which is the things that you don't have in place don't seem to have any bugs. The moment you put them in place, uh, then it's a question of relative kinds of imperfections. And so when it gets up to the Supreme Court, uh, you have the semi-hysterical view, which says that if we start looking at the situation, the world is going to burn up unless the United States changes the way in which it starts to work with admissions facilities. And then the question is, well, what's the source of this problem? And the first flashpoint that one wants to make is, uh, global temperatures declined slightly in 2021 with respect to 2020. And in the years between 2016 and 2018, uh, first month in both years, we had the largest two year over year decline in global temperatures that have ever been. And at all the time, the level of carbon dioxide starts to be moving severely upward. And so it's just very difficult to get some kind of correlation uh, that explains both the ups and the downs by looking at a single variable. If you then want to say in the face of this that the technology that you're going to pose is one which has demonstrable effect, uh, effectiveness, what you've done is essentially messed up the language. And it seems to me that the majority of the court in this particular case, when it stressed the fact that all these things are completely unproven, not only unproven, there are also technologies that have alternative devices that are every bit as serious. It turns out that wind isn't silent, it creates noises. It turns out that in order to build a wind turbine, you have to have intense heat in order to fabricate the blades. It turns out that the rate of decay uh, from where the wind is created to where the thing is going is very, very large. It turns out you get all the wind that you want when you don't want it, and none of the wind you want when you want to have it, uh, because the wind does not simply track in any way, shape, or form the consumption pattern. And unlike fossil fuels, you can't turn this thing up or down. And you could say the same thing about solar energy. So what you do is you see a government trying to take a small uh, part of the overall regulatory code and to use the famous phrase of the late Justice Scalia, to stuff elephants into mouse holes in order to bootstrap a program which is unsigned. So it's the same point that I wanted to make before, which is you actually have to spend some time trying to work through the science on these particular cases before you want to set these sort of gauzy optimism. There is too much deference with respect to people in public places. One of the things that I bridle at more than anything else now is the notion that somehow or other we have a cartelized economy in which certain people are regarded as experts in certain areas, and anybody else who wants to comment on anything that they do is a trespasser upon the silo which they inhibit, and so therefore we can ban them. Well, then it turns out some of the people inside the silo with great expertise uh, credentials, they're also banished from misinformation. And so what you do is under the name of fake expertise and media domination, you get these incredibly monopolistic situations 
where in fact, what happens is if you don't get cross currents, it's very dangerous. So how does knowledge work? And I think the Supreme Court refuses to acknowledge this, at least many people, and certainly the Biden administration. But there are two kinds of knowledge. Uh, one is the incremental improvements that take place within the system, taking a propeller engine and making it a little better. And then from the outside, you want somebody who can figure out how you transition from a propeller engine to a jet engine or to something else. It's the same thing like going from vacuum tubes to transistors. And what is generally the case is the more systematic shifts are made by outsiders, precisely because they have a set of technologies, insights, and restless intelligence, which enables them to do something that grizzled veterans within a particular field do not. And so uh, this is not just a lecture about Supreme Court cases, Merrill. It's a lecture about epistemology. Um, and it turns out we really seem to mess all of these things up in the way in which you do it. So that's the first two cases. Now, I have to talk about another. I'll save abortion for last. Uh, not that I don't have anything to say about it. But another case I think that it, it's kind of worth talking about under these circumstances is the gun case. And uh, why do I do that? Um, it's because this illustrates a different proposition, which is when you are starting to do a legal case, the first question you have to ask, are you doing this from first principles on the assumption that there's a blank slate that no other judge has disgraced or embellished the world with their own particular opinion? Or are you taking established precedent, which is clear and uniform, and treating that as the point of departure for everything that follows? And this is extremely important in the gun case. So I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to recite it more or less from memory uh, to realize that a well-regulated militia is necessary for the security of a free state, right? So the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. 28 words, two clauses, each about 14 words each. Now, the first thing you want to do when you're engaged in statutory interpretation as a matter of principle is to ask yourself, why do they put both clauses in there? And if you looked at the famous Heller case in which Justice Scalia, I think, messed it all up, well, what he did is he essentially said that the first 14 words were just surplusage. They were encouragement, they were embellishment, but they didn't do anything substantive. If you look at the actual document, one of the most interesting features about it is if you go back to Article I and Article II of the Constitution, it has a very elaborate, rather complicated scheme of checks and balances, which is designed to regulate the way in which the militia can be used. It's one of the few things in which you get divided authorities between the federal government and the particular states. Uh, the states actually run a militia. The federal government gives you a discipline, i.e. standard, so as to make sure that these forces can be interoperable when they're called up into federal service. But the president can't do that unilaterally, even though he's the commander in chief. There has to be some congressional authorization that's going to start to take place. And then after they're brought up, you're in charge. And what the militia clause in this particular context is, is a further embellishment. And it seems to say uh, that the right to keep and bear arms is an important thing to leave to the state. So the federal government cannot do regulation on those kinds of things outside of what is done through the militia in its ordinary situation. It's a state issue. At which point it turns out the only place the militia clause doesn't apply is Washington, DC, because that's not a state. And Justice Scalia, he wrote something very odd in there. He said, oh, when we're talking about state, we're not talking about Virginia, we're talking about France or Germany. And the moment you see that in an American constitution, you know there's something deeply wrong. But this is already established. All that stuff is gone. The militia clause, rather the second amendment now applies to the federal government in DC. It also applies to all of the states after McDonald's because we incorporate something to bind the states, right? Even though it was originally designed to free them from what the states could be subject to federal regulation. It's one of these ironies of history. So what did Scalia say? Well, he was very clear as to what he said. Once we have this clause, uh, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. We know that it has to be subject to some regulation, just the way the freedom of speech and everything else has done this. We call these police power regulation. And so the question is, what justifications can the state put forward in order to explain why a restriction on guns should be used? And if you want to keep the gun out of the hands of somebody who's a deranged killer, um, the right to keep and bear arms can be removed in order to protect the public from depredations which are highly likely to occur. Well, how much scrutiny do we start to give? If you go back to the earlier cases, it seemed there was a very low level of scrutiny. And somehow or other, uh, constitutional lawyers who don't like mathematicians 
call this low standard rational basis as if there was some rational form of proof. What they simply mean is you got an excuse to do something and you don't worry about what the arguments are on the other side. And Scalia's opinion made it clear that it was intermediate scrutiny. You have to worry about the trade-offs. So then you look at the New York statute and what do they want to do? They want to say that in order for you to carry a gun outside, you have to get special approval from the state to show that you're at risk for greater things than anybody else. Well, that's an awfully powerful kind of restriction as far as I can see. And the issue is, well, what's the justification with respect to its operation? And it seems to me you can say you need that to deal with imminent perils. It seems to me that you can say that you have to prove all of those special justifications. When what you could do is take a more modest position and say somebody who's had a class in being out of gun safety should be able to do it. One of the questions I always ask myself, to which I can't quite give the answer, is how many people who have taken a course in gun use from the NRA have ever committed mass torts of one kind or another? I would guess the answer to that question is either zero or very, very close. And so what you want to do is to encourage people like that to get guns and to carry them outside, conceal the open, whatever turns out to be appropriate. And so I think the Supreme Court got that one particularly right, uh, given the way in which it starts to go. And again, I mean, if you start looking at the ways in which these things have happened with respect to guns, it's the areas that have the most restrictive gun policies, which are those in many cases which have the highest rate of crime. And there's an explanation for that, the target's assault. You go into a school, and if it's Uvalde, Texas, and you've got some jerks running this particular operation, a guy to take his time to kill the children one at his time. You need to have people on the ground who have and know how to use weapons in order to deter mass killing. And if you're simply going to try to get it for the manufacturers, it's going exactly in the wrong place. You can do something through distributors, insured, with respect to access to guns and so forth. Uh, but what happens is the idea that New York has got a rational and sensible system is wrong. And my guess is that if you apply the New York rules, the net level of crime committed by violent weapons and perhaps other things as well would probably increase rather than decrease. Because one of the first rules of constitutional interpretation is you never, ever assume that somebody who has a benevolent purpose has proved that the means that he has chosen will satisfy the purpose at the end. And so we're three for three on this one. Biden claims that his particular mandates are gonna stop COVID. He's just completely wrong on that issue as anything that you could imagine. Uh, the EPA thinks that it's going to be able to solve the problems of energy overconsumption and so forth with solar and wind. They're just absolutely out for lunch. And then what you do is you get the gun case in which there's every bit of the same kind of foolishness with respect to local government. So this then gives you this terrible problem. Are courts any better than judges? Rather, not of course any better. Are courts any better than legislatures? And this is a, a distinctive race to the bottom, in which you can find thrilling examples in which both sides exercise incredibly bad judgment on one question or another. And so, trying to figure out how you do it, I think the answer is probably the one we've come to. You'd rather have two bites at the apple than one, because you don't want. Uh, to give any branch complete power. So a legislature isn't going to be forced to do something. If it is, it could be oversight. But you don't want the oversight to be kind of trivial. You want people to take very careful looks at what they're doing. You don't want them to be wildly indulgent, but we don't want them to be totally frivolous. So to some extent, it requires an informed legislature, doubtful assumption, informed judges, and increasingly doubtful assumption in many cases, because everything has become so politicized. Speaking about things that have become politicized, I guess one of the things that people might want to look at just a wee bit is what do we make about these abortion cases and so forth? And let me tell you, um, my age is now showing. Back in 1973, when I first joined the University of Chicago Law School faculty, the late Phil Carolyn comes up to me by the um, elevator and says, you're writing about the abortion cases. Now, uh, basically the University of Chicago achieved its intellectual greatness in the early 1970s by a system of conscription. They didn't care what you knew. What they said is, I think you're capable of writing this thing, and damn it, you're going to write it. And so that's how I became an expert, so-called, with respect to abortion. And I think it's extremely important to do so. And then the issue is, what did you think about Roe v. Wade, uh, which is certainly very relevant to the current discussion and so forth. And here, Curlin and I actually had some fundamental differences on the particular question. He put the title on my article, which was different from the article that I wrote. So his title was The Abortion Cases, Substantive Due Process. 
And what he did in effect is he basically said, these people forgot the lesson of Lochner against New York. And the lot term Lochner against New York is legislatures ought to never uh, be shut down and judicial bodies ought never to essentially overreach. That's a lesson that's been learned by many a learned professor from the Harvard Law School and student, including the Chief Justice, um, who always thinks that Lochner is the sort of ultimate sin with respect to adjudication. I come from a very different tradition, a classical liberal tradition. And what I saw Lochner was as a case in which the state wanted to impose various kinds of monopoly restrictions on entry and exit into various kinds of labor markets. If you trace back the situation, the maximum hour laws essentially were highly pro-union because union workers worked in two shifts, each of which was under 10 hours. And it turns out non-union workers slept on the job and their provisions about adequate ventilation of the basic statute. So they were working much more than 10 hours. So this is a case in which a statute that looks neutral on its face in fact, this has a very heavy skew when you see the way in which it starts to apply. And so to my mind is the real question was, was there a health justification or not? And that was an issue you can debate, but at least it was the right question. Whereas when, if you now do it in the abortion case, prima facie, uh, you may have a liberty, but the idea that there may be no health justification with respect to an unborn, whatever it is, is difficult. And here the terminology is extremely interesting. People who are intent upon abortions want to call it a blob or an entity. But you talk about any expectant mother who's going to the doctor, and from time after time, they say, well, the baby is now two ounces tall or, or, or large and six, you know, like six centimeters long. And you treat this thing as though it's the child that it's going to become. And so you have to figure out which of these two things is right. And the position that I took, although I'm not a Catholic, is that I couldn't think of any point for demarcation apart from conception uh, that would capture the difference. So I became, as it were, uh, through this intellectual process, having no political involvement whatsoever, as something of a pro-life guy. And so uh, Curlin said, this is for the legislature to decide. And I said that there's an antecedent moral question um, which reflects the police power. And it seems to me that uh, control with respect to abortion just falls within it. There are many people, most commonly asserted today, say, well, this does not respect the autonomy of a woman. And my answer to that is the autonomy issue is absolutely dominant before you get pregnant. It tells you whom you may or may not have various kinds of sexual relations with, or your choice, not anybody else. Same thing with respect to marriage, premarital sex, you name it. But once you've committed that and you have now have given life to a separate party, it's a whole different game. And that if the child were born, you would have fiduciary duties. And now that the child is unborn, you have the same thing. It turns out it's much more complicated when the unborn child is in the mother because there's no way you could separate the treatment for the child from the treatment for the mother. So nobody would ever say that you could kill a recently born infant in order to help the health and psychological well-being of a mother it would just be murder. But if it turns it's inside the fetus and you have all sorts of genetic abnormality or other kinds of topic pregnancies and things like that, it's a real messy situation. And so my position has always been prima facie, the ban ought to last, uh, but there have to be an intelligent set of exceptions, which is not trivial, but some is very far from abortion at will. And so I thought that the legislative system that was in place was essentially the correct kind of solution, even though I was quite willing to agree that uh, the dam was going to break and things were going to start to change. I, I didn't think it was appropriate institutionally to go from a state in which virtually every state had some prohibition on abortion to where you had Harry Blackman, who knew essentially nothing about the science or the legal history, saying that all these states somehow or other have got it wrong. I think that a kind of you know, transformation that's really extremely difficult uh, to start to make. And so I came out on the pro-life side of this issue, as I said, without any religious preconceptions, wrote this particular paper. And then, of course, the issue essentially remained uneasy for many years. Why was that? Because I think it's clear that for whatever reason, the huge bulk of academics and serious legal thinkers who looked at Roe as of 1973 were convinced that it was profoundly wrong. Different reasons, Dick's explanation, but there was nobody there who wanted to use the current record uh, that essentially procreation is a fundamental autonomous right of a woman, and it has to be protected come hell or high water against any and all kinds of operations. Well, we now fast forward 49 years and, and what's going on. 
uh, about the clear for the repeal. It's clear that they didn't take that option up in, in Casey in 1992. And so I used to joke to people, well, what's your particular attitude? I said, well, I have seven days of the week and on uh, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, my particular position is I think that stare decisis ought to control and that the appropriate way to deal with this if you are pro-life side is to make the moral argument so that the number of abortions you're going to see is going to be fewer than it was before because people will now become fully aware of the gravity of the situation and that sonograms and other pictures will in fact change the way people behave. And it has, the number of abortions tends to go down in these situations. And then there's me on Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays, right? And what I say is, oh my God, this is a decision which is just so bad in so many ways with trimesters and everything else. It's perfectly opposed, perfectly appropriate to strike this thing down. And so what happens is, uh, what takes place then is kind of instructive. We see that there is a huge degree of polarization inside the United States. Places like New York pass preemptive statutes, which say in the event that Roe v. Wade is overruled, we will turn out to make it the statutory law within the state. So all the people who had institutional objections uh, to courts making these kinds of decisions, who wanted to delegate it to the legislature, had nothing whatsoever to say against that particular situation. I'm very unhappy about that because I was trying to take the moral line on pro-choice. I was rather on, on pro-life. I was not trying to take the institutional line. So I'm sitting there. And what happens is you look at the opinion and, and Alito is very careful in the way in which he crafts it. He is surely correct in the way in which he characterizes the logic with respect to Roe v. Wade and how it was written. My favorite illustration, which he didn't talk, is one of the things that Harry Blackman does is he quotes a famous line from Oliver Wendell Holmes in his Lock in the Descent, right? In which he says, well, the Constitution is made for all sorts of people of very different tastes and sensibilities. What Holmes meant by that is the legislature should dominate. That's what he was arguing for. Now, Harry Blackman is so confused, he thinks that passage now explains why it is that the court should be able to dominate. <laughs> you have this complete inversion of these passages by a guy who has no idea what's going on. And everybody but everybody is caught on this endless dilemma is we all believe that the legislature control except when individual rights are too important to be ignored. And we disagree as to exactly the way in which we implement that particular program. So what then goes on? Well, what uh, Alito does is he tries to explain at great length why it is that this is the kind of precedent that we should be able to overrule. Uh, there's no particular reliance that a woman who's yet to be pregnant has on the decision. It's enormous. Uh, the institutional arguments go all the other way and we won't put this back to the state. Unfortunately, one of the things that you discover is that the world doesn't stop. And there's no way, and I think everybody got this wrong, myself included, that you can create the legal and social and political institutions of 1970 in 2020. Can't do it. And so what's the first thing that happened? Well, this thing doesn't go back to the states. It goes back to the federal government, right? And you read Attorney General Garland, and he's out on his high horse saying, He's going to use every tool in the federal armory in order to make sure that women's rights to get access to abortifacients is going to be protected and so forth. Mr. Schumer comes forward and says, I want federal legislation under the Commerce Clause, which does this. Nobody in 1972 ever thought that any of these particular things would be appropriate. Uh, for one thing, we didn't have the massive regulation of drugs that we had, and we had a completely different sensibility about what the scope of federal power was and so forth. Then you start seeing the kind of threats that are made to the life of justices and so forth, parading in front of their houses. This is not just one lone person with a picket say unfair to women or whatever. This is just sort of massive intimidation of one kind or another. And so what you've done here is you have to face this down. Um, I'm still unsure whether it's worth the price. It's not that I think that Roe was rightly decided. I've never changed my mind on that. Uh, but there is the question of how many convulsions can you live with? as opposed to the other type of situation. I don't even know what the answer to that question is. I still don't know what the answer to that particular question is. Justice Thomas then comes forward and he writes an opinion saying, all oh, the substance of due process stuff is rot. And so we have to rethink every one of these cases. And he's always taken that line, including on Lochner. I've always been quite sympathetic to the substance of due process. 
because it seems to me it started with the rate regulation cases in the 1890s. And what it's starting to say is if you get massive redistributions of wealth that take through by the legislative process, then there's something wrong about the way that process is done because legislation is designed to create social improvement shared by all rather than have huge transfers from one side to another. So I don't agree with him on that. But that doesn't mean that I'm a majority. You can now see that every one of these fractured elements comes back. Then you look at Justice Kavanaugh and the others, and they take exactly the same line that Alito, not that Alito took. We're only after Roe v. Wade because life is sacred. We have no interest in Obergefell. We have no interest in any of these other cases like Griswold. We're just doing this for one very simple reason. This is a constitutional outrage. We're not asking the question whether it was rightly decided at the beginning. We know they're all wrongly decided, you say. But we're asking whether it's so terribly decided that we override it, and we have different judgments on that. And so what you do is you get the majority, and some people want to treat it as an opening wedge, and others want to shut the door. And then on the left, they're having a field day and starting to say, you guys can't even keep your home house in order. We know exactly what the right thing is. And what's terribly wrong about the American left today is it never stops to think whether there's an objection to anything that it wants to say on any issue on which somebody wants to talk against them. But what happens is this is a situation in which the political decourse today takes place the way in which modern poker players play. Now, uh, this is a bit of an analogy, but I think it's actually quite accurate. I've read, I don't play poker, um, and this is not chess, but poker is a game in which it turns out the traditional view was that generally speaking, you bluff occasionally, and then you basically bet, bet in accordance with the strength of your hand. Um, it turns out no serious poker player plays poker that way today. What they do is either it's all or nothing, because the moment you start using this gradual stuff, you're giving too much information to the other guy. So what you have to do is to make him choke. And the way you make them choke is you either get out because you don't like your five, three, and hold them game. Or what you say, I got a pair of nines, boom, in we go. Well, that's the way politics is today. And what happens is if you get politics of gang tackling on the one side or abandoning the field on the other side, it leads to terrible discourse. So I don't care what goes on at the poker party game, but I Richard, do I'm, care. What, I, one I'm second. Good. Okay. Uh, but I do think that that's it. And so I'm happy to take any questions on this. You see, <laughs> including from Merrill, uh, because, I mean, there are other cases about it, but uh, the element we have is twofold. One is a real disrespect for science and an unwilling to try to mask it. And then we have these institutional excessive ambitions. And then we have this huge partition of everything turns out to be, oh, it's either all or nothing. And this is going to create a very unstable political environment going forward. Thank you, Richard. Tom, I'm going to get you to uh, tell everybody what to do to ask a question, then I'll jump in and ask the first one. Okay, so I think I've just unmuted myself. So uh, again, use the Q&A function down at the bottom of your window to type in questions. We already have a couple, uh, and I'm sure we'll have a few more. I know that um, I've got enough questions to fill all the available time myself. So I don't think that's going to be a problem, but just use the Q&A function, type in your questions, and then we will moderate them and we will get to as many as we can. Okay, let me go back to Richard. Now, Richard, uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure, I, I think you may have poured cold water on me a little bit here because in the, e, uh, the West Virginia versus EPA decision, what I yeah. liked about that was that the, it, they, the justices and the concurring opinion and so forth all said, you don't have the power to do these major things without Congress granting you that power. Mm -hmm. And so part of what I thought would might happen is, well, maybe we're going to take a little bit of pressure off the Supreme Court. The liberals are going to start looking to the state Supreme Courts, uh, to state legislatures to try to do what they're wanting ah. to do. What I think I heard you say on the abortion issue is it's not going to go back to states. It's just going to go to the federal issue. It's going to go to both. I mean, look, th this is essentially a multi-front war. And if one side thinks the other one is not there, they'll push hard. The moment the first side comes in, the second will respond. And it's going to be a bloody war of attrition one way or another. Now, what you did in the thing is you alluded to something which I did not mention, which was the so-called major questions doctrine, um, which is an extremely interesting doctrine. I regard it as irrelevant and incorrect, but not for the customary reason. Uh, the customary reason is that uh, when you're dealing with general questions of statutory interpretation, uh, the Chevron doctrine says, unless the test is clear, and we don't know what 
clearly, clearly means, right? I mean, uh, or we defer to the administrative exercise to figure out the way in which this thing starts to work. And what happens is if you do this, you can get real major sea changes uh, long before things come up. And so even before Chevron, this was always a kind of an issue in administrative law. So if you take the question of what do you conclude as a navigable waters of the United States, right? One definition is it's gotta be something in which you could float a log down um, because you're now navigating the river for logs and you don't want holdouts to block the way in which you move. And that was the original origin of this navigation servitude. Um, in 1977, a bunch of guys sued the federal government and all of a sudden they agree that navigable waters of the United States mean not only the waters, but it means anything that pours anything into the water. So what you're doing is you're claiming the ability to regulate what goes on on the dry land, sometimes a hundred miles away from what the river is. And there's a famous case called Sackett in which a guy had a bone piece, dry piece of property in 2010. And they said, you've got to get a permit from the, uh, basically the, the maritime folks and then the Army Corps of Engineers. And if you know, this part of land may be worth $150,000. You know, We're going to find you $35,000 a day if you violate this particular thing. This is the poker game that I'm talking about, right? Do you really want to fight that? Well, they get the Pacific Legal Foundation. They go to the court. They get a, a ruling which is good enough. But like most administrative rulings, it's good for this case and this case only. And so cases like this are coming right back to the Supreme Court now, where all sorts of things that take place on dry land are supposed to involve what's water. Well, the major questions doctrine, right, would not allow you to do that. You could not expand from in the water uh, to everywhere on the land. And so how should you do this? Well, my view about it is everything should be treated as the major questions doctrine in the following sense. Every question of law under Section 706 of the Administrative Procedure Act is to be determined by the agency subject to review de novo by a court. And so if you're going to do it for all questions, no administrative agency can say that we've got expertise that immunizes us from the normal rules of statutory construction that apply when you have a huge statute, two alternative interpretations, one by one private party and one by another private party, right? The court will decide. Them. They can do exactly the same thing here. And if the government has all the expertise it claims, it should be able to argue on the merits and win. And sometimes it will and sometimes it won't. One of the things that you discover when you read these cases is the level of preparation that the government put forward varies on a scale from one to 10 with all numbers included. They can even have cases in the same term, one of which is really quite well argued and reasoned on nuclear power. And the other say, oh my God, how is it that grown men and women can actually hold high places and come up with this kind of stuff? And so it's a very highly variable a sort of situation. And so I tend to think you do it and just treat the way, when I wrote my book about the dubious morality of the modern stress administrative state, I said that essentially you treat an administrative body like it's a trial court. And a trial court gets no deference on questions of law. It gets a lot of deference on individual questions of fact. And there's a kind of a vague, very difficult intermediate standard when the question is whether or not uh, the facts that you find individually amount to some operative fact under the statute. So uh, you look at all the particular facts to see how much pollution is coming out, and then you make a judgment, this is an unreasonable risk of this, that, or the other kind of plan. That last thing, unreasonable risk, is something that there's going to be appellate review on, but it's not going to be quite the same thing as the issue as to whether or not the statute covers the waters of the river or the entire world. And I think that's the way in which it ought to go. Justice Roberts is trying to finesse the game, and he's doing what many smart people do. He's saying, I can't overturn Chevron, but I could cut back on it. And then you cut back on it, and then the next question is, how major is major, right? So would you apply the major question doctrine, for example, to the vaccine case or the mass case? You, you have lots of problems. I tend to be much tougher on that, um, closer in that case to Justice Gorsuch's position. Uh, but I think, on the other hand, when you start having to micromanage particular questions of factual disputes, that's no more appropriate in an administrative agency than it is with respect to a trial court. So um, I think, in effect, the way in which you want to handle that is to say he was surely right to do this in this particular case. Uh, uh, but I hope it's just the first step in getting rid of Chevron and putting in place the scheme that I just mentioned a moment ago. Good. I'm going to turn it over to Tom now. Tom, you're not speaking. You got to put okay, it on. There we go. There we go. 
Richard, I, I so appreciate that last thing you said about eventually getting rid of Chevron, because I think that's that's what a lot of us are looking forward to when the right case comes along. Any case so is I have the right a, case for that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. So I have a couple of, of first of all, I want to just point out something. Um, we, those of us who, who always thought that Roe and Casey should be overturned because they were poorly reasoned, you know, we used a shorthand and that would return it to the states. But of course, the, the opinion says return it to the people and to their, to their elected representatives. So, uh-huh. you know, so we so that so the federal government can, absolutely can still act there. And so don't you think we, we what we might end up with is some sort of a hybrid of you might have a federal law that prevents states from completely outlawing abortion. On the other end, you might have a, a federal law like a, that won't allow abortion, you know, um, in the last month or something like that. And then a whole bunch of sort of state laws that govern everything in between. I think the answer is uh, when it is you have a single disc and the question is you can now cut it in half. Is there a unique place where it's going to be cut? And the answer is no. We have no idea which of these variations are going to take place and why. Mm -hmm. What is very clear is that there are some issues that are more ripe for federal intervention than others. And so back in 1967, when I was a law student, I was given the impossible task of arguing a case called Cosgrove and Gleitman. And I was arguing this case for Miss Cosgrove, who's a Catholic woman. Dr. Gleitman was a Jewish doctor in New Jersey. She had a baby with rubella. Abortion was essentially legal in New York at the time for these kinds of circumstances, but not in uh, in New Jersey. The question was whether the doctor was under a duty to tell her about this particular alternative so that she could abort the child. Uh, now, that's an interesting case with respect to the mother, right? You know, she has the extra care when she gives it. My job was to argue in favor of the child under a theory known as wrongful life, right? Um, now, I'm not going to talk about the, the comical situations that that arises, uh, but the important thing is this question of interstate transportation is going to be absolutely critical. You live in a red state. There's a blue state nearby. Uh, you're pregnant. Can you go to a blue state? Can the state of your citizenship prevent the abortion? Can the state of your citizenship prevent local doctors from referring you there? Can the state of your citizenship prevent some outside corporation from sending you a plane ticket and giving you paying for the abortion in some other state? Those interstate conflicts have not been raised yet, but they will come up just as it came up in a very minor way in the case that I argued in the moot court final of the Yale Law School in 1967. So um, I, I think the answer is yes. I also think that there are going to be all sorts of other things. I mean, I've always thought that the absolutist position is wrong. Uh, Abortion to save the life of the mother, I think is fine. Save her from serious physical injury, fine. Save her from major psychological depression, maybe fine, right? Saving her from the irritation and burdens of raising a child, not so good, right? You can see how these things start to go. And there's just going to be a very strong lack of consensus with respect to them. Uh, the merits of federalism, of course, and you see it both sides, is you divert it to the states, different states could come up with different solutions, and then the laboratories of competition would tell you which work. Uh, the merits of the national solution is uniformity. We don't have all of these borderline transactions that I talked about before. Uh, those two values are extremely stubborn, that they cut in opposite directions. And there's just no way that you could satisfy them both simultaneously, right? Which is why the whole question of federal jurisdiction becomes such an ungodly mess. Um, they are very heavy, weighty circumstances on both sides. This will have to play out one way or another. Um, it's not going to play out before what takes place in November. Um, I, for one, do not believe that abortion will be able to save the Democratic Party uh, from what looks to be a debacle coming forward. I think, first of all, there are many people who actually kind of agree with uh, what Justice Alito did, either on the moral or on the institutional ground. I don't think he's alone. It's only if you read the Washington Post in New York or the New York Times that you think everybody understands that this thing is completely wrong. But I think there are a lot of people who feel the other way around. Uh, African-Americans have tended to be conservative on this kind of issue, maybe not so recently. Hispanic vote, which is moving very heavily towards the Republican side, I think even in Texas, if I'm not mistaken, you guys would know that better. 
Um, that's a strong Catholic tradition. And I just don't believe that most Hispanics, Latinos, Latinas in Texas um, are strongly going to be on the strong uh, pro-choice side. I mean, and if they're ambivalent, that means that other issues are gonna start to dominate. So I don't think it's gonna happen, but you then get a different looking Congress. And if it's a Republican controlled Congress, I mean, at this point, it may well be that you'll try to get federal legislation of the sort which says that no state may, and then give a series of prohibitions on what state can do, at which point God knows the way in which the politics will play out. I tend to prefer leaving it to the states as a first order solution, given all the problems that arise. But the trade-offs are so hard that even if I've made up my own mind, it's extremely difficult when trade-offs are real and both sides have weighty interests, you're now playing a balancing game, right? And so my stack is six inches high and yours is at five or is it seven? And we just don't have calipers that fine to allow us to play the game. But people who want to think about balancing that should always look at a balance beam because what you're saying is you've got a prima facie case put together by a plaintiff and it builds chips on the left of these balance plates and then you get the split with the state on the other side. Uh, prima facie case, less justification. That's exactly what was going on in every case that we've seen thus far, including the gun case and including the environmental protection cases like so forth and the water cases and so forth. Balancing, alas, is a necessary consequence of a phenomenon which never occurs in social life, known as uncertainty. Right? But the moment you have uncertainty, you will have balancing on the remedial side of any particular question. And it's one of the things as I've gotten older, um, I wrote a book called Simple Rules for a Complex Set of World, right? And I still believe in bright line rules. Uh, the difficulty is if there's a deviation from the bright line solution and you're in a second best world, what do you do then? It becomes very messy. And so the strategy you make uh, intellectually is you try to reduce the number of deviant cases as small as you can by a real enforcement of the basic rules. And then for the rest of it, you have to resort to tests of reasonableness and good faith, which generally are going to require discretion, jury power, and all the rest of that stuff. And there's no way to escape. So the way to try to solve the problem is to reduce the scope rather than to make a, a balancing risk utility test, the first and only test of liability in every old system. You want bright line rules and use the other stuff only when there's been a deviation from those rules. Okay, I have one more uh, quick question about the EPA decision. Um, and I appreciated your answer about the major questions doctrine. You are a master at sort of explaining the nuances and the subtle details and complications of these cases. Most of us don't look at them that way. Most of us look at it very, in a very simplistic binary kind of way. And there's a lot of us who really would like to see the Supreme Court reign in the administrative state. And so that's why, you know, we saw the EPA case as, as, as great, but ultimately we would really like to see Chevron done away with. Now, you previously said, do you think Roberts operates from an assumption that he can't get rid of Chevron? Or and he doesn't want to. Doesn't want to. Okay. Look, he harbored mid 1980s. And he has no independent intellectual base. You know, I went to law school in England. First course I ever studied was Roman law. The last course I ever taught this year was Roman law, right? I'm very heavily influenced by that system, by medieval English law and so forth. And so I tend to look at things through an alien prison. Most American lawyers in the 1980s, uh, what happened is they understood the real excesses that had taken place in the 1970s, right? With Roe and similar kinds of cases and a lot of the sort of wildness everywhere else. And so this is the Reagan years and there's a period of reconciliation or, or retrenchment with respect to these excesses. And we start looking a little bit more like the kind of reasoned elaboration people of the 1950s than we do about the hell come high water cases of the 60s and 70s. He's a graduate, I think from 1986 or so. Uh, Justice Kagan comes from exactly the same period. Me, I don't come out of an American system in the same way. I went to the Yale Law School, but by I, at that time I'd already been for two years in law school overseas. And, and my priors were very different from virtually everybody else's. And so when I come to American law, I have the following very profound difference. I think of everything as a basic question in how you solve the problem for individual rights, develop a common law or a Roman law solution to these problems, then figure out what transformations you have to make to a sufficient private solution in order to allow for the government to function in a distinct fashion. 
Most other people start in exactly the opposite direction. There's a constitution, let's explicate. I'll give you one illustration. Justice Scalia is absolutely in that Harvard tradition. He graduated in 1960. That was the period of reasoned elaboration and legal process of one form or another. And he's very cautious about doing things. So he gets to the constitution, all of a sudden he finds the standing doctrine to be absolutely attractive. The problem is it's not in the constitution. If you're a strict constructionist, it says the federal judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity. There's no limitation there. It's a case in law, it's a case in equity. He never could accept that argument. And we used to have these arguments about this. He said, your position is bizarre. Well, I actually think it's bizarre and correct. So if you go back to the Latin system about locus standing, right, that's the origin of the standing, or you go through the English situation and the natural law stuff, you can come up with a jurisprudence of standing that begins with article, the judicial power shall extend to. You have a basic conception of the role of courts. And then when you get to the federal courts, Article Three limits jurisdiction. It doesn't tell you what standing means. And so everything he says by this light would be incorrect. Well, this is not the dominant wisdom, right? So I'm the freak um, running the outside the road show. But you know, I don't believe intellectual debate is a matter of majority vote. I think you put your best case out there and let somebody else come and hopefully you can sway opinion so that it's not just simply an electoral choice. But you should probably take questions from somebody else. I, I, I was just going to say, speaking of somebody else, let's get to some of these questions. So we have a question from Jeannie Short, uh, and I'll read it. Uh, can administrative agencies circumvent the EPA case by asking legislators to insert language into legislation that explicitly grants wide powers to the regulatory agencies? Uh, so essentially, you know, can, can, can Congress do that if it chooses to do that? Can Congress cure the problem, right? Yeah. Well, if you go back to this, it's very similar to the abortion type debate. Um, you don't have the question of a runaway agency if it turns out that Congress is given an explicit authority to do these sorts of things. And so the answer is, well, that may solve the administrative law problem, but it may not solve the takings problem, which is going to exist. So suppose, for example, what we do is we grant to an administrative agency the power to annul any and all debts for whatever reason it happens to see fit. So we don't have to worry about all those funny stuff associated with the bankruptcy laws, right? Now an insolvency. That's going to be unconstitutional. Not because there isn't the agency to do it, but there's another theorem that's in place, which says if Congress could not do that itself, right? It can't delegate an agency to do something that it cannot do. So you'd have to try to figure out whether or not what the stuff they're going to do is going to bump up against it. That's the first problem. The second problem is it turns out that you know Congress itself does not have unlimited powers over everything. Uh, there are restrictions as to what it can do. And so not only do you have the individual rights questions, but you also have the question is, yes, the Commerce Clause is broad, but is it that broad one way or another? And so you know if the Congress passes a statute which says, we think that the federal government through the EEOC or some other agency can regulate dormitory rapes within the state. Um, you have a Supreme Court decision saying the Commerce Clause doesn't go that far. And if I were running the Commerce Clause debate, uh, uh, the Commerce Clause would look completely different from the way in which it's going to be done today. And it would apply mainly to situations having to do with interstate transactions of one form or another. But the old synthesis from E.C. Knight in similar cases that it doesn't cover manufacturing, mining, or agriculture would probably still hold. You'd create, maybe not by constitutional design, but affect sort of competition between the jurisdictions over these things. And under that system, oh, what Jeannie's saying can't possibly be right. So uh, the last part of this is if we are going to change the way in which the, um, the federal government um, is going to work on these things, if we're going to change that, okay, uh, what's going to happen is you're going to have to go through all of these things. So I think it's a terrific question. Uh, but the answer is hers is a presumptive, but not an absolute fix. We have a question from Paul Smith, who says he was one of your torts students at USC in 1969. First year I ever taught the course. There you go. There you go. So he was he was part of the pilot class, huh? Yeah, well, so he was Paul, the victim. Yeah. He was the victim. <laughs> Paul says, can you speak to the effects of the efforts to externally influence the Supreme Court? Well, Paul, I mean, that's a torts question, right? And one of the things that we have to worry about are the torts of intimidation. 
And so the, let me go back to the sort of beginning of this. And there's a long history. And the history is what is picketing? Is picketing a way in which you present your particular views to the rest of the world so that they cannot ignore them? Or is picketing an effort at, in fact, the use of implied force in order to get people to change their minds one way or the other? The first area in which this arose is one that has arose in many cases, which is labor disputes. And labor disputes had existed from the early part of the 19th century, but with the rise of industrialization in the post-Civil War period, a unionization and its efforts became an extremely controversial subject. There were no special statutes which dealt with it at that time. Uh, that had to wait until the Railway Labor Act of 1926 and the National Labor Relations Act of 1935 and the Norris LaGuardia Act, all that other stuff. And so it was done by common law rules. And there's a famous case called Vegalon and Gunther in which there was a decision by the majority of the court which said, at least under the circumstances of that case, the picketing was coercive and therefore unfair. And then there was an impassioned dissent by Justice Holmes, who took as a kind of like, look, we just have to let the chips fall where they may. Uh, this is a world in which uncertainty is there, and we've got to roll with the punches. And he was, at that point, kind of a hero to the left, although later on, if you remember, after he wrote some of his other cases, like Buck v. Bell, uh, people started to think of him as being the, um, you know, the guy whose three gen generations of imbeciles is enough. He became a very bad feature by Westwood Pugwood. So it goes there. Nobody's quite sure what the right answer is. It's a facts and circumstances test, right? And so now you start looking at these cases. Uh, after Begelon and Gunther, there are a large number of English cases that start to take place on this particular front. And they break both ways because they're not quite sure as to whether or not if there's a threat which is made by one person, it could be legal if it's now made by a group of individuals. And there are a bunch of cases which go both ways on that thing and tell finally what happens is in a case called Quinn B. Lethem in the Glad Morgan case, the English courts start to say that a collective refusal to deal by a labor union is what we would call a section one violation of the antitrust laws. And then they reverse that by statute in 1906, the Trade Disputes Act. And what they do is they make legal, essentially, any action that could be done by one person may be done by many people. So a collective refusal to deal out from under the statute, unless there's an immediate threat of violence, right? And that means economic pressure is now perfectly legitimate. Comes into the American setting, and by 1914, we have the Clayton Act, and it has not only a provision under a progressive Woodrow Wilson administration, where it liberalizes the rules, which allow you to go after mergers, right? They don't have to be monopolies. They could be substantially tend to reduce competition in section seven, but section six, what it does is it tries to insulate uh, both unions on the one hand and agricultural associations from, on the other hand, from the application of the antitrust law, right? Uh, so that the right to organize now becomes semi-sacred. Uh, there's a case in 1921 or two called duplex against steering, in which what happens is uh, the Supreme Court rightly, in terms of the history, says you may be free to organize, but what you are not free to do is to organize a boycott against a particular firm by going to its customers and saying that if any of you start to buy from these people, we're going to picket you and shut you down, either by calling your workers off or by forcing your customers to go somewhere else. And the Supreme Court said you can't do that. And then the history just keeps going back and forth. There's a case called Thornhill, which says, God, you know, picketing's just fine. And then you start to see the way in which it works. And all of a sudden, the Supreme Court gets a lot tougher on this issue, back and forth, back and forth. And so the ultimate question is, what do you think? Now, here's what I think. And this is where I think the Supreme Court has made a terrible mistake on this particular subject. I think for the most part, it is not going to work to have facts and circumstances rules. What you need to do is you need to have a particular set of rules that are going to be much more hard-edged and much more simple. So to give you one famous case, several years ago, nine Supreme Court justices managed to get this proposition wrong. Uh, abortion clinics are constantly the subject of pressure, right? And what are you trying to do? You're trying to tell the public that these things are murder, and you're also trying to prevent women who are wanting an abortion from getting in there, right? One of them is a legal message, and the other one isn't. If you think that you could hit these women with sticks and stones and grab them, you can't do it. So what Massachusetts did is it passed a statute which said 
Uh, we're going to create a safe corridor. I think it was 40 feet, but it doesn't matter, maybe 35 feet, in which uh, they can go. It's close enough for you to talk to them, but not close enough to hit them. And the Supreme Court said it's unconstitutional. There's a classic illustration of how judges are so enamored with fact and circumstances tests that they then put themselves into these interminable imbroglios, which you ought never to do, when in fact that kind of rule will work and so forth. Now you get to the Supreme Court justices. And um, I wrote my last column on the defining idea saying that I thought there was a lot to be said uh, for the particular rule, which says, and this is the federal law, that nobody's allowed to pick it in front of the home of the Supreme Court justice because it's intimidation. And then there's state court rules, which says you can't pick it in front of a home because it's an invasion of privacy, which means in effect, you take them out of that form. Now, one of the things you could try to do is use the abortion type situation, right? But that's crazy, 40 foot corridors in front of a home. What you have to do is you say, sir, you can't pick it here. Go to a business establishment and pick it there, which is what these statutes start to say. And then we'll worry about this. And what happens is the United States uh, federal office, the attorney general won't enforce the picket statute by getting people away. They say, oh, we'll give you protection. It's a great comfort to a Supreme Court justice with, you know, Amy Barry has seven children, right? Is to have not only a bunch of people with bullhorns putting them on ID lines ready to kill them in some sense, but also have a bunch of cops out there who are constantly facing them down. I regard this as just intolerable. And I think you just ought to remove them and if they want to pick it in front of the court, I think what you then do is you go to the time, place, and manner regulations that I've talked about, but you don't do it around home. And then the Maryland office said, oh, you know, there are a bunch of cases out there, one called Mosley, in which it turns out that you're not allowed to stop picketing um, for abortion unless you stop picketing for uh, labor disputes. Now, the reason they had the exception for labor disputes is there were some earlier cases which said these things have to be special, right? So either you must make the decision or you can't make the decision. You can't have a constitution that requires both simultaneously. And my view is what you do then is you go to the correct distinction, which is if you have a battle over abortion, you do not want to have one rule in which the pro side can do this and the anti side can't or vice versa. There's got to be parity. Uh, but if it turns out abortions are a special problem, I think there's no reason why you can't regulate for abortions because you don't want to regulate for pickets who are upset about the purity of food and the delicate taste. And what you do is the remedial stuff can be done area by area and problem side, unless you can show that there's a skew. And what Justice Marshall said is that you have to cover all subject matters equally. And my view, that's a proposition which say you have to treat different cases alike. And so I think that that's wrong. So in the end, I think if you put all this stuff together, you come up with a reasonably coherent view in which the willingness to tolerate these pickets here is a mistake because it's going to lead to intimidation. Uh, uh, Jonathan Turley, normally a smart guy, said, well, you know, everybody knows Dobbs is old. So we can't say that they're litigating, you know, getting in front of this house in order to get them to persuade to change Dobbs. Well, there are going to be 100 cases coming up after Dobbs. And what they're doing is they're investing on the installment plan to see if they can intimidate them on a wide range of cases, including everything that has a 6 3 majority. So I regard this as very bad conduct. And I think one way you can now distinguish between conservatives and liberals, at least a little bit, is to say that the conservatives have never done that to the liberal justice. And I would be appalled if they did. I do not think that this is a case in which if the other guy acts like a perfect jackass, you're free to act like a perfect jackass. I think you still have to do exactly the right thing and constantly pressure these guys so as to make them back off. I regard this is very difficult. I regard, I think it's fair to say, Merrick Garland as one of the great disappointments of the Biden administration. He seems to have a backbone of jello. We have several questions that touch on non-delegation. Sure. And so um, probably this will be the last sort of the last topic we probably can get to in our time. So our friend Randy May uh, at the Free State Foundation, who lives, he lives in the world of administrative law. Oh, he's a friend of mine too. He says, after West Virginia versus EPA, what is your view of the relationship between the major questions and non-delegation doctrines? Because there's a lot of differing views there. I should also point out that AJ and Stan Lambert have also asked questions related to non-delegation and everyone seems to, to want to be able to, to get at non-delegation. 
Well, look, I mean, I think we understand why the non-delegation doctrine is so important, at least in the extreme cases. So let's go back and start with the origin, the origins of the doctrine, which is in a famous passage by John Locke, in which he announces that the state, which gets the legislative power, cannot delegate that particular power to another body, right? And, you know, so you want to figure out what's going on with non-delegation, even give it to the current Supreme Court. We get the current Congress, and it's in its infinite wisdom, it votes unanimously, that for the next two years, everything that Richard A. Epstein thinks should be law will be law. And they do that. Well, I mean, if anybody else, the answer would obviously be no. And if it's me, it's obviously no as well. What happens is the great problem that you see there is that you have a sort of a random, but some sense of distribution of what these cases are going to be like when decided by legislature on various statutory measures. And the great problem that you worry about in delegation is whether or not the delegation is going to give you a different distribution so that the distribution that the electorate wanted to choose is going to be replaced by a distribution that the Congress chosen. And think of it this way. Uh, the Congress is 52, 48 in favor of the good guys. They're always the good guys. And they then want to delegate this, and they delegate it to a body, which is now 60, 40 in their favor. Right? At that particular point, the outcomes are going to change. And this is, you're not worried about efficiency justifications here. You're worried about the fact that you're going to switch away from democratic politics and put in a set of results, which may also be legitimate, but not the ones that the original body have it. And we do all agree, I think, that you could have uh, a debate as to how long or whether or not something should be done, and you could take two sides. So in the Gundy case, which is one of the you know, telltale cases on this, there's a huge question as to whether or not we believe that the SORNA, the various kinds of registration requirements for sexual offenders, should apply to people who've been out of jail and who may not have received notice of these particular things, or may be unfairly treated because this is a sort of a retroactive law with respect to them, but not with respect to other kinds of people. And they had that back, right? And so what happened is they couldn't decide it in the Congress. Now, what you should you do under those circumstances, because I think the Supreme Court just got it wrong. This is Justice Kagan. She thought this would mean the end of the administrative state, a bit of hysteria, I think. Uh, what you should do is say, you can't decide it now. This is what you do. You pass a statute uh, which says that for people now in prison, when they're released, we're now in a position where we can give them instructions as to what they have to do. And so we don't have to worry about trapping innocent people. We'll do that. And then Congress can come back to it next year after it sees this. And it can decide one way or another whether or not it wants to extend it to retroactive situation. The moment they say yes, then you know it's going to be incumbent upon them to either devise the rules of notification or to have somebody else who does it. And I think it's permissible to allow some degree of delegation within limits to figure out how you give notice to people. But I do not think it's appropriate to decide. We're going to tell the attorney general, you can decide whether to make the statute apply retroactively to people who are privacy there. And then he doesn't do any kind of a study. So, yeah, I think it should. I regard that as absolutely outrageous because there's another method. But on the other hand, suppose they had decided to do it retroactively, then they give you four tests. You have to give reasonable notice to people so that they will not be charged. Now, reasonable notice is a vague term, but it turns out it's a term that's used in every procedure statute known to mankind uh, because you can't give perfect notice and you're not going to be set up for no notice. So the rule is if you can give actual notice, you must do it. But if not, you can give both the notice, right? I mean, there are all sorts of things like that that you have to do. So it seems to me uh, the second kind of delegation is okay because this is the proposition. You want to have delegation where the downstream administrative agency has the kind of knowledge that is not possessed okay, by the Congress so that it can, in effect, get a sharper resolution of a problem without switching the needle politically from one side to the other. Right? So if it turns out you're at the 50-yard line, you want to delegate to a body which is going to stay at the 50-yard line but just do a better job than the Congress could do. And so there are very powerful efficiency justifications for this. And then in other kinds of cases, it seems to me that you can't do this. And so there's this recent case in the Fifth Circuit, I remember by, by Judge Elrod, in which, you know, I think it's just a straight due process issue. You cannot try people before judges of constantly shifting composition. Uh, but I'm not in favor of sort of saying, well, you know, this is an illegal delegation to prosecutors to figure out whom to prosecute. 
The prosecution problem in individual case is completely different from the SORNA type situation. Of course, there's always going to be problems of figuring out, do you or do you not have a case strong enough to prosecute? Do you or do you not have a budget that is big enough to prosecute? Do you or do you not have a series of priorities that are clear enough to do this? And prosecutorial discretion is one of the nuts that nobody is able to solve by judicial oversight. You just can't do it. What you have to do is you go after the egregious cases. And so you can say, I'm going to prosecute you for the following reason. You are black, you are white, you're gay, you're straight, whatever it is, the vendetta cases. Then you start looking, okay, you now solve 1% of the cases at most. You still got the other 99% of the cases, which ones you put your energy on and which you don't. So how do you deal with that problem? The answer is oddly enough through delegation. But the delegation is now made to the district attorney's office. And we say, what we want you to do is to establish a program to oversee these prosecutions in order to reduce evident disparities in either funding across districts or police departments on the one hand, or in the treatment of particular kinds of cases on the other. And so you have to delegate some of these things. And so therefore, I mean, to sort of say, we want to get rid of the delegation doctrine is wrong. The first thing you want to do is understand how this darn thing works and to understand that from the beginning of time, we've always had it. So, you know, there's people who said, well, our delegation was completely unlimited. We had a situation where Congress delegated uh, to an administrator how to administer a pension program for revolutionary war veterans, right? Well, I mean, you start looking at the statute, the delegation took place only after they had actually made a specific appropriation. And the delegation was trying to figure out how you could weed out timely from non-timely claims, fraudulent from non-fraudulent claims, perfectly sensible, right? But suppose what Congress had done is we want to pass a statute and we will allow an administrator to determine the budget that we're gonna use for pensions. You can't do that. That's a power which is specifically delegated and kept into the hands of Congress, and you can't claim it. So a lot of what people say about the delegation doctrine, it's not that there isn't a doctrine there. It's exactly the opposite. On cases like this where the text is mandated, it's always complied with, so people don't try to do those sorts of delegation. Right? That's not an argument saying there's no delegation doctrine. It's just basically, it's a version of saying, you look more like the John Locke version of giving legislative power out wholesale than you do the Richard Epstein version of trying to figure out how you put the nuts and bolts together. And I don't think he gave exactly the right explanation in terms of probability distributions that I did, but that's the instinct behind the Justice Gorsuch decision in, in the Gundy case. And so I would just beg them when they start coming to this sort of thing, is first to kind of look at these various kinds of delegations and see the strengths. Let me give you another illustration. Um, you know, the Congress essentially delegated all sorts of powers to administrative to set rules for unfair competition um, in the Schechter case. And there are two issues on this, one legal and one duration. The legal issue is what do you mean by unfair delegation? And if you're a good common lawyer like me, what it means by that is the use of various kinds of fraudulent techniques to either passing off goods that um, are your own as, as though they were by a better manufacturer or, you know, so taking advantage or disparaging their goods. You can't change the relative value of your goods and somebody else by puffing yours up fraudulently or denigrating his fraudulently, okay? That's perfectly fine. And then all of a sudden they say, oh, what that means is anything that has to do with the way in which markets operate can be unfair, i.e., inequality of bargaining power, endless disclosure of things that don't matter. And remember, this is like the difference between regulating the river and regulating the world. It's exactly the same thing in this particular area. And what Justice Hughes said quite rightly is you could do the narrow common law stuff, you can't do the broader stuff. And I think that that should still be true so that when you start seeing people talking about unfair competition under Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act, and so forth. You don't want to treat that as a carte blanche delegation. And when Josh Wright was there, his parting gesture was an immensely important one, trying to tie that down so it looked more like the antitrust version of this and the consumer fraud version of this, rather than this whole scale delegation. And now we have the imperialist Lena Khan and the imperialist Jonathan Cantor trying to move exactly in the opposite direction. God protect us from them, if he possibly is benevolent enough to do that. But the other point, whenever you have delegation to look okay, at- we only have a couple minutes, Richard. So. Okay, Dominic, just one last point. Okay. Is what's the time limit? 
so, we, 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 we probably no, 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 in the statute. Oh, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm not asking about the time. I'm asking about the statutes. You look at those statutes, and there's a famous line by Justice Cardozo about saying, Oh, these statutes involve delegation run riot, right? But the key thing to understand is the delegation was only given for the length that the current Congress sat into power. And so what happened is these guys were never prepared to let the administ next administration appoint its people to these agencies and use the powers that they create. And so in virtually all of these cases, you have to figure out how long is this particular delegation going to go? So when somebody tries to give a complete delegation uh, to the Consumer Fraud Commission for a five-year period, you know what they're trying to do is to give him absolute discretion when the next president is going to take over. And I think that that should provoke some kind of reaction, which it did in some of these recent cases. So it's like everything else. Um, you clearly see that something is wrong when you say that the doctrine has no place whatsoever. But once you reject that extreme position, you have to be very careful and very painful in the way in which you try to work out its correct parameters. And, uh, and uh, you know, Richard, as, as a donor once pointed out to me, if Congress doesn't like something an agency is doing, Congress always has the power to change it if they're willing to act. So ultimately, it's, it always falls at the feet of Congress one way or the other. Yeah, but there's too much frictions in between. And let me say what I think is wrong with that, okay? Sure, okay. Um, what happens is, you know, if your guy is doing that, saying, you know, I'm going to have a case next year, it's fine. But the guy who's caught in the vices of the current situation doesn't have that option. Right. And, and so what happens is, is this constant view, do you change things prospectively as a prudential matter or do you change them retroactively I, from the time that the statute was first passed by saying that it transgressed various kinds of constitutional limits? And we've already indicated those could be jurisdictional limits, separation of powers issues, right? Um, delegation of authority situation, individual rights. I mean, we have a doctrine in the Constitution which is redundant trying to put more things in place than you might possibly need if the world constituted angel. And the problem is you put all these moving parts together and they move in opposite directions or they move out of sync. And when it turns out that the conflicts are really apparent, it's going to be a question of second best of judgment as to how it is you figure out which of these canons ought to be used or which not. So when I'm looking at the abusive delegation that takes place to the PTAB, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, I don't want to stop that by a non-delegation doctrine. I want to say that it's just utterly unconstitutional of you to try somebody when you have the power to rig who the judges are going to be, not only at the beginning, but if you don't like the result the first time, you could get them to change it the second time or the third time. I regard that as just an abomination. And it turns out the Supreme Court in Lucia and in the oil states case and other similar cases never has been willing to take that one on. And I regard that as a mistake. Because that's an easy case, right? And, and, there and, are and, as, and as you know, we feel very strongly about the PTAB stuff too. So we're-, yeah. we're Well, I mean, yes. I mean, I wrote about that pretty extensively and so forth. I mean, this is Justice Thomas was the bad guy on this one, right? You know, he writes some really strong opinion. And then he writes an opinion in which he manages to get every single precedent wrong. 100% wrong. <laughs> All right, well, I'm Richard- we got to stop there. We're 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 at, we're at our time limit. I could listen to you all afternoon, but we're, we're going to have to wrap. Well, this up. we've already lost twenty of our people, right? Well, that, you know that's okay. Uh, that's we understand okay. that Haydn's farewell symphony, right? And and, and we also know only the two are left. That that also allows us to know uh, who the hardcore folks are too. So that's always fun. So Richard, uh, thank you so much for 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 giving us your time. It's always a delight to listen and talk. I, I'm I'm going to need a little bit of time mentally to recover afterward. It's hard to keep up with you, but it's always enjoyable. We very much appreciate it. And for, for those of you who joined us today, we very much appreciate you joining us. Hope you hope that you got something out of it. Hope you learned something, or more likely, probably found out all the things you don't already know. Uh, don't forget that this video will, within about 48 hours or so, be available on our website and on our YouTube channel, so you can share it with folks, or if you need to go back and rewatch it uh, to catch some of the things that you missed, it'll be there for you too. So Dr. Matthews, thank you very much for helping out today. Uh, thank you, Addie Crimmins, for helping out putting this together. And thank you, Betty Medlock, for helping. And most of all, Richard, thanks so much. Uh, good health to you and continued long service to the cause. And well, thank you. And thank you so much. We've been friends for a long time. Maybe we'll do another book together. <laughs> Maybe we will. Maybe we will. All right. Well, thank you to everyone and have a good rest of your day. Okay. Bye-bye.